I want to talk to you about something that's extremely powerful in the wildlife world and whitetail world. And, uh, and really looking at habitat and saying, if you want to attract a huge amount of wildlife to your land, then you need to do this. And I'm talking about old field conversion, but there's a right and the wrong way to do it. And towards the end, I'll give you an example where, you know, largely a lot of people do it um, to where they have a hard time actually having sustainable wildlife populations. But if you do it this way, you will have sustainable wildlife populations. And I'm not only talking about deer, I'm talking about rabbits, pheasants, butterflies, birds, bees. You can have a huge amount of diversity and variety by doing it this way. And guess what? It stays up. The cover stays up the entire winter. And for that, you have sustainable wildlife population because most programs out there, most old field conversion programs, whether state, federal, private, they're not going to give you cover that stays up the entire winter. And what do the wildlife do? They die. They leave. They're gone. They're picked off by predators. They have to have cover all winter. And if they don't, then you don't have sustainable wildlife populations and you don't have fun. I want, to, I want you to explode your wildlife. Simple concept. And we'll talk about why this is hard to do uh, for folks, but really not that hard to do. And uh, I want you to imagine this is a, this is a field. 20 acre field, 10 acre field, five acre field, 50, doesn't really matter. In that entire field, you wanna convert it. It's an ag field, it's pasture land. It's a useless land right now, useless CRP. Whatever it might be, covers laying down during the winter. I want you to imagine this entire field as one big switchgrass field. Now that's not what I want you to do. I don't want you to plant that in all switchgrass. I have a client, Bob, he's a great client. Uh, one of my favorite clients, Diane knows him, Diane's met him, met his wife. Uh, my son's been on his land, found a giant shed, his first shed he found on his land, and Bob is awesome. Bob was talked into in the past, and he'll be the first to tell you that it was a mistake, but he was talked into a program where you planted 30 acres of switchgrass, leave it alone, and what he's finding is the pheasants are on the outside, but not on the inside. The deer don't go through it, they don't live in it, because it's one big block of switch, and unless there's just incredibly terrible weather and they're trying to get out of the wind, they don't go in there, because deer need to feed five times in a 24 hour period. That means feedings one and two, which I refer to one and two is the first feeding in the morning and daylight. And then the second feeding early afternoon or around lunch. And then the third and most important feeding is when they actually travel to food plots, ag fields, high quality food, because they've been sitting back and eating browse in their bedding areas twice. And then the fourth and fifth feeding of the day is they're at night in that 24 hour period and you want those to take place those feedings to take place on your neighbor's land if possible because then you can control the daytime movement which on a mature buck is only three to four hundred yards long at most two to four hundred yards five hundred yards in, in big open wood settings and then at night if they have a three three mile home range you really don't care <laughs> you just want to control that short movement this allows you to do that all switch grass so the whole thing so imagine taking diversity pockets and let's say this is 10 acres so we're gonna make these a quarter to an eighth acre pockets, maybe a half acre at most. And we're gonna put pockets throughout here. These are non-switchgrass. But not only are they non-switchgrass, they're non-grass. There's no other grass that's food. Switchgrass is not food. So if it's not food, it's gotta be covered or it's useless. And in the case of switchgrass, it's the only grass that you can count on to stay up in a northern winter all fall and winter long. And so the switchgrass out here, all throughout here, so switchgrass all the way through this area, everything is switchgrass in here, all the way surrounding all those pockets, it's all switchgrass. That switchgrass is providing your base cover. This is no different than if all those pockets were in the middle of a bunch of red cedar. They have red cedar removal programs. A lot of them are actually timber forestry creation programs, which are actually bad for wildlife. You don't want to remove a bunch of switchgrass and plant a bunch of hardwoods. You don't want to remove a pocket of, of red cedar and plant a bunch of hardwoods. It's just timber management. If you own your property for wildlife, this talk is for you. If you own this property for timber management, you need to go find another channel and another source for your information because this is for actually creating wildlife and exploding the wildlife populations on your property, and this is how you do it. All these areas, these are all diversity pockets. These are what are going to provide the browse and regeneration on your property. Now that you have these early discussion of growth pockets defined, no switchgrass, you kill out any grass that's coming because any grass, you know, again, 
It's not going to be food. It's not going to be cover. You want that switchgrass as a base. Again, no different than red cedar, a pine thicket, a spruce thicket, a thicket of autumn olive, a thicket of some type of shrub that is actually containing and can actually house wildlife and, and deer because you have that cover. These are early successional growth pockets. You could just let them go. Spray the grass out, let it convert over to goldenrod, ragweed, little bits of clover, alfalfa, woody shrub tips, hardwood regeneration, whatever it might be. It doesn't matter if it's only a foot high because in most areas that switchgrass is going to be at least three to four feet high by the end of the first summer and it'll house that browse within and therefore house deer. This should be an area where you could drive by in October and you won't be able to see the deer that are standing within and you of course you won't be able to see their browse that they're feeding on and because they have that food component in there they will be in there again not only whitetails but pheasants, rabbits, butterflies, bees, and birds. So a lot of different wildlife. A great way to start those pockets is if they're open and bare, just have an old ag field conversion. You can add box elder seeds, red maple seeds. You can take John Walton's, Walton from uh, Big Rock Trees out of Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. He's one of the premier um, distributors and sellers and growers of different cuttings. So you have red twig dogwood, willows, lots of different trees. He has hybrid poplars. You can stab those right in the ground and just let them go. You can just spread it out out there and let them go. Does it make sense if you're planting conifers in those pockets, you're kind of just adding to the same. Conifers have no food during the day. They just provide cover. That's what switchgrass does. It is a diversity of cover, but and it's not a bad idea to have a few pockets of conifer out there for diversity of cover, but also great. You have to have browse in some type of browse without in these pockets. I want you to add up the edge in there. You know, going back to Bob's property where he has 30 acres of switchgrass, you run that outside diameter and you get that linear edge in feet, yards, however you want to express it. And that's the amount of edge he has in that area. You take this, let's say at 30, it's 30 acres and you add up all those pockets in there that total about 50%. You could have 40%, 60%, doesn't really matter. Imagine the amount of edge. You're looking at many times the edge over just the outside exterior. I talk about that in another video where I relate your overall edge and outside measurement of your land, the inside edge of cha habitat change, diversity change, age of timber, type of timber, elevation change, wetlands, should be at least five to ten times more than the exterior edge. The alternative to that is one big switchgrass field. Not much edge, not much wildlife. Big stand of hardwoods, not much edge, not much wildlife. Big stand of conifers, the same, big stand of red cedars. But you do something like this, if this is all red cedar, you'd pocket this out at least 50 to 60 percent. You'd spot spray the red cedar, young red cedar that comes into those openings, kill them, kill any kind of grass because it's not food, and then allow hardwood regeneration and shrubs to take place, broadleaf weeds, so that you can actually have a food base in there. Now you have a huge wildlife bonanza. It doesn't matter if it's red cedar or switchgrass. The cool thing about switchgrass, you can accomplish this in one to two years. Now I want to talk about, I want to show you a property design where I added this feature. And you'll see in a lot of my designs, I have these brown shapes, you know, off to the side, and that's where I add these features. And I want to show you an example of what unfortunately a lot of people get trapped into with trying to convert an old field old field that really doesn't turn out as powerful as they want it to and sometimes it's lying flat during the winter so it's basically non-existent and it's a very big mistake and i'll tell you why people make those mistakes and they fall into that and uh and we'll talk about that i want to show you this property plan because putting this right here and installing it on a property can happen quickly and boy it can explode your whitetail population and the use of your land by whitetails, let alone every other piece of wildlife that actually takes advantage of that location. This is an example of taking this really powerful old, old field conversion technique and applying it to land. And you can see in this area right here, this is open ag. It actually stretches out for a lot longer. This picture's cut off. But if you can imagine this entire ag field, it's rimming it in a food plot. It's allowing him to have stand locations towards the outside. Here's a road right here, a river on this side. And really to fill this land, he just has this area worked on right now. And it's going to triple the amount of use on his land, create an opportunity to hold three or four more times deer than he does right now, lengthen that movement, hold mature bucks. So the areas he has bedding areas right now in back in the woods, they'll become true mature buck bedding areas. These brown pockets, so same thing, early successional growth, broad leaves, shrubs, trees. He was even talking about getting some trees. He's a Michigan client, but he's going to get some uh, 
some cuttings from uh, John Walton at Big Rock Tree so you can just stab them into the ground. Very easy way to get some high quality um, growth in those pockets quickly. And at the same time, collecting box elder seeds, red maple seeds, throwing it out there. Those are all great browse, especially when they're young. And you can always cut those down or renew them later. You can always just mow the field. And uh, when, when the switchgrass needs to be cut, five, six years, if you burn it, that'll come back. So great way uh, to manage this, not only right now, but for the long term. And I expect him to have deer living out there this year. I want you to notice something. This area back here, all conifer across the river. Notice those pockets in there. Those pockets are removing pockets of conifer. Doesn't matter if it's red cedar, spruce, pine, whatever it is for removing those pockets, killing any conifer that's coming in there, creating the herbaceous growth with broadleaf weeds, regeneration, hardwood regeneration, woody shrub tips. And it's the same thing. So it's the same thing applying it right here out in an open field. It's the same exact concept that I've been teaching for many, many years, going back to my early days of doing this. It's the same concept of putting it in conifers here. It's the same concept of putting it into this open field. Works extremely well. Now I want you to take a look at something. I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to get rid of this picture right here. I'm going to get rid of some uh, unnecessary pen marks here. I've used some pen marks to, to protect the client and their locations. This is a different kind of example. This is a client that had to use CRP programs. He wants to enroll it in. And out of his 70 acres here, he's going to end up rolling around, enrolling around 50 acres into CRP. And it is a, 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 you know, an effective cost savings for him that he needs at the moment. He's only going to enroll for 10 years because the thought is in 10 years, he wants to let it reconvert back to a natural state and actually be able to put the actual plan that I have in place for those early successional growth pockets. And I wouldn't be surprised if he actually calls me in a couple months and says, you know what, we didn't enroll because I wanted to take control of my land and actually explode my wildlife population to a higher degree. And the reason is, is I've broken it up so that he can have a better chance. We're putting more of the grass blends towards the outside, yellow lines of switchgrass 20 feet wide to separate all the different compartments. That allows deer to actually relate to the switchgrass and wildlife pheasants to have escape cover, rabbits to have escape cover. The orange areas are the pollinator and flower blends where you have more of a forb and forage component. The brown areas or army green as he said, those are the grass areas where you have a higher chance of cover. We're surrounding all of it in switchgrass. We're surrounding all of the food plots in switchgrass. That big giant food plot location. This created the depth that I talk about on this parcel. The house is right here, roads right here. We're going parallel to the roads. So we're not jamming a bunch of deer across the road back and forth to get hit. But bottom line, this is a traditional CRP that we're using the CRP to save him some money, but at the same time, really protect. He has berms along the road, the black areas, really protect and hide his deer habitats within. And that's going to work for him, especially when you add in the woods here that he's creating hinge cuttings in with red maple and at, he's cutting the ash, cutting the aspen out of there. So he'll be able to have a pretty good stand, but not as effective as, it, as if he had the early success, successional growth pockets and those diversity pockets within switchgrass. That's the ultimate, that's the ultimate edge, ultimate diversity. I hate straight lines, but that's the way the government's gonna make him do it. And he's gonna save some money, but in 10 years, he's gonna really explode it from there. And, uh, and hopefully it's broken down enough by then to where he hasn't, doesn't have to do much other than add some switchgrass pockets to it. Now that's the problem with a lot of pheasants mix, pheasant mixes. And that's a lot of problems with these big state agency plantings is that you're planting all of it with a machine across 40 acres, 20 acres, 30 acres. It's a lot more time consuming to actually go out there and create those pockets. I don't believe they know how to do this anyways or they have that experience level to put it in. Their thought is, this is the latest and greatest mix. Forbes and forages, food component, grass component. Tell you what folks, if there's a food component in your grass, it's not good bedding cover. A lot of people think, well, I'll just take the, uh, the um, grass and I'll put lighter amount of switchgrass in, five or six pounds for bedding and eight or 10 pounds for screening, hogwash. If it's light enough for deer to move around in it, for one, they still have to have a food component or it's not a bedding area. They have to have daytime browse. And if it's light enough for deer to walk through it easily, then it's gonna lay down or it's gonna be exposed at least 
during the winter time and that's too light. You need it at eight to 10 pounds per acre so it stands up to a harsh winter, especially in the north. And don't ever fool yourself into thinking, well, if I put five to six pounds or if I make it a quote diverse grass blend of big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass and switchgrass, that it'll somehow attract more whitetails. Again, I say this all the time, more grass is not diversity. I got into arguments online with people like that and if they're on my YouTube channel or my Facebook and they want to argue about this, I just delete them and ban them because they don't have the experience to know that more grass is just more grass. So that doesn't mean it's diversity. Diversity comes when you have grasses, briars, shrubs, hardwood regeneration, conifers, broadleaf weeds. That's diversity. Young and old timber, that's diversity. Early successional growth pockets, fields, that's diversity because more grass is just more grass. It doesn't mean it's more diverse. It doesn't accomplish anything. You have to look at it from the wildlife's view or, or from a deer's view, um, a rabbit's view, a pheasant view. If there's no cover standing in November and December and January, February and March, that diverse pocket of garbage that you had out on the, on the property and that CRP mix is worthless. And that's what it is. And that's why a lot of the pheasant mixes fail. They plant this 40 acres of pheasant mix, all the cover lays down. They have to replant pheasants every spring. That's a traditional tried and true pheasant operation. When I can have clients with two acres of uh, switchgrass pockets in the same area that stand up the entire winter, they collect pheasants. I got a, a great, great text. One of my uh, good clients, Bill from uh, Lower Michigan, he sent me a text that was just awesome. One of my favorite texts that I saw all last year. And it said, hey, Jeff, just wanted to let you know, we saw seven hens. We kicked seven hens out today and we saw four roosters or heard four roosters, whatever it is. And he didn't have pheasants five years ago, four years ago. He tried these mixes, he tried these blends, and guess what, we planted over them. And so this is something that actually works. These diversity pockets are incredible for you. I want you to experience huge wildlife populations and effective habitat practices. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, I'm not gonna be PC either. This stuff works. This is the best way that I found. And let's face it, you know, I hit a thousand clients this year in 27 states. Been doing this since 2005. Been doing it on my own since 95. This is a passion of mine, obviously. You could probably tell that uh, by watching these videos. I'm only gonna teach something if I think it works. I have no other agenda. It, you know, my goal and my mission is to help you as much as possible and to give you the most effective habitat practices, whether it's for wildlife, deer, or whatever, on the planet because I get paid for my reputation. I get, I'm in high demand. I really am. I, we're gonna turn away over a thousand clients this year. We've already turned away over 600 because we can't get to their location. I have pockets of clients where I work out of one motel and then I fly about to about um, 12, 13 clients a year. And, and that's my, I, that's, I can fit 90 clients in a year and that's about it. And, we're, and I'll probably do a lot less next year. Um, but I get paid to be effective and to give effective recommendations. So you can bet with all the experience I have on all the properties, I've seen it all, I've seen what works, what doesn't work. And if I recommend it, you can guarantee that I'm not only recommending it to you, my viewer, I'm recommending it to my clients that pay me thousands of dollars to come to their property. I write about it in my books. I offer as much free content and information as humanly possible on this channel. And uh, I just want you to be successful. And please try this, try this feature. Try the uh, pizza looking feature on the board behind me and it'll work for you. It's the best way to convert an old field to incredible wildlife potential. And I want you to grab that potential this year and run with it and enjoy it this fall.